Welcome to the Kiwi Mana Day. Hi, this is episode 142 of our beekeeping show. Beekeeping in the Hawke's Bay with beekeeper John Barry. We are Gary and Margaret. We are Kiwi Mana, and Kiwi Mana are beekeepers from the hills of the Waitaki Ranges on the wild west coast of Auckland in the North Island of New Zealand. Yes, we build and sell beekeeping equipment and bees provide beekeeper services and education. Okay, this interview was recorded in March 2019, and the Berry family is a well-known beekeeping family, and in this show we are going to the branch of the Berry family beekeeping tree and talking to... Yes, John Barry. And the show notes for this one are kiwi.bz slash Barry, B-E-R-R-Y. And who helped us bring this show to you? This show is made possible by you, our amazing supporters. Every show, we read out our top supporters. And on the first show of each month, we read out all the supporters. Thanks to you all. Without you, we wouldn't be able to keep doing this. And we appreciate it. And you motivate us. Oh, yes. That's right. And this week, we'd like to thank Trish Stretton. Lisa Morrissey. Nathan Buzzinger. Beekeeping. Malcolm Sanford. Goodney Hunter. Barbara Weber. Christopher Brown. Greg Parr. Thanks, guys. You are awesome. Oh, yes. <laughs> okay, and as an introduction, John Barry is a third-generation beekeeper and has worked in the family business Arataki Honey before starting his own business, Barry Bees, with his brother, Peter. He now produces comb honey for the Hawke's Bay Farmer's Market. Oh, yum, yum, yum. So, John, what do you love about beekeeping? Oh, I just like getting out there and getting onto farms, just seeing the countryside and seeing the bees. And it's always it's always different. You never know what's going to happen. You don't know whether it's going to be a a good day or a bad day or a good year or you know just it's always something new. Even bees that have been working you know the same sites for fifty years, and you still find something new to look at and something new to see. It's ever evolving, isn't it? The environment and the weather. Weather's always different, and the slightest change in the weather can just change things completely. Like this year, is, it was as good a clover as I've ever seen this year, and it was pretty blooming useless. It just The weather conditions just weren't right, and it just didn't yield a... Eh? We got a little bit. It wasn't terrible, but it was... It should have been the year you got 100 kilos, but it was the year you got sort of 20 or 30. <laughs> yeah, you think it was a good summer, eh? You think it would be yielding quite well, but obviously not. A lot of cold thunderstorms, and that, that cold rain from a thunderstorm has the same effect as when you get irrigated dairy country or something like that. I've had bees near irrigated dairy farms in Hawke's Bay and they just produce nothing. You know, they might get off the neighbouring farms, but the irrigated country is just completely useless. Is that because it's just not producing the clover flowers or what's the reason? No, the the flowers there, I think it's just cold soil temperatures. Oh, okay. How did you get started in beekeeping? Well, my grandfather was a beekeeper, my father still is a beekeeper, and I started going out with Dad probably when I was about five, and I've been doing it ever since. Wow. Yeah, I mean, for overseas listeners, the, the Berry family is quite a big beekeeping family, aren't they? So how did, how did you originally get, originally get into the beekeeping, the family? My grandfather came, he actually had bees down at Neriha, which is down in the Wairarapa. They were milking cows down there. I, I believe they were milking them by hand. They had machinery to milk them, but they couldn't afford to, the electricity to run them, so they were milking them by hand, and they just had enough of that, so they came up here, and my grandfather was working in the office at the freezing works. In his spare time, he was looking after bees, and when I know when Dad left school, quite a young age, he started helping with the bees, and then they set up Arataki Honey. You know, when Granddad was at the freezing works, he used to get the offcuts of white pine that they were used to make barrels for exporting corned beef. Made boxes out of that, and I've still got some of those boxes. It's amazing. Are they about 60 years old in those ones? Yeah, they'll be getting, they'll be about 70 years old now. Wow. That's good wood then, isn't it? Yeah, Yeah, and they're still in really good condition. I mean, I've seen hives rot out here after about seven years. Just, I guess it depends on how, how wet they get, eh? The modern pine is very fast growing and it's just got no staying power when it comes to 
um, you know, rot and that sort of thing. The old pine trees that are, you know, 60, 70 years old, they've got a lot more resin in them. They, the timber weighs about three times as much, but they'll, they'll last for 40 or 50 years. The modern fast grown pine, it's, you know, they grow really fast and they rot really fast. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. And your uncle still runs Arataki Honey? Russell still runs the branch at Rotorua, at Waitapu, and my father, Ian, is in charge in Hawke's Bay. He's slowed down a bit the last year or so, and my sister actually manages the factory. Yeah, because they've got a big honey centre there, haven't they? Yeah. So for any, any overseas listeners, that'd probably be a good place to check out, wouldn't it? Yeah, you know, that's just not the sort of marketing I'm really interested in, but it's a great place to take friends and visitors and that sort of thing. There's all sorts of, or apart from just honey, there's lots of interact, interactive stuff. There's stuff for kids to do. There's a little bit of a beekeeping museum there. There's a wall of bees so you can see a queen and that sort of thing. And, yeah, no, it's a pretty good show. Yeah, oh, that sounds good. I've, I've, I must get down there one day. So, John, if you could travel back in time before you started beekeeping, what's one bit of advice you'd give yourself? Oh, stay at school and go to university, I think. <laughs> no, I hated, I hated school. I think I would have loved university. I've, I've got a real passion for conservation. I do a lot of voluntary conservation work, but I'm not sure I would have been any happier doing it full time. You know, if you work for DOC, you've got to do what they tell you to do, whereas if you you do conservation work as a volunteer, you can do what you want to do, which is sometimes doing what you want to do is a lot more fun. It's one of the best things about being a self-employed beekeeper too. You can, you know, you gotta, you still got to get out of bed and do the job, but if you, if you don't feel like it today, you can do it tomorrow. Yeah, yeah, true. Because you're, you're involved in is it bird rescue as well, eh? Yeah, I do a little bit of that, but a rehabilitating injured, two, mostly twoies and moorporks, that sort of thing. Yeah. Oh, wow. And um, beekeeping fits in well with that, actually, with baby twoies because drone larvae is brilliant food for injured insectivorous birds or or young ones. Mm. I've even helped supply it for kiwis. Yeah, and it's good for chickens too, isn't it? Yep. It's supposed to be pretty good for eating too, but I've I've never tried it, although... You know, I sell comb honey at the farmer's market every Sunday and I had a woman from the Philippines come one day and said she liked my honey but what she really wanted me to supply was some drone brood so she could eat that. Yeah, I've, I've seen them actually cooking it in the comb. I mean, you'd think it would, all the wax would melt off, wouldn't you? Yeah, I don't know. I'm, I do know that some of the, I don't know about all the tribes, but some of the tribes that go out honey hunting, they want honey but the primary thing they're going after is the brood and the pollen. They want the protein. I have seen people stir fry brood comb and you know, and with chili and stuff. And but yeah, I've never eaten it either. It doesn't sound appealing, eh? Yeah, I've eaten the odd queen cell just to show I'm not scared of it. But um, yeah, I don't know if it does any good or not. <laughs> and beekeepers need to be very careful when lifting. What can beekeepers do to prevent back injuries? You know, I started beekeeping full time at 15, and by the time I was about 18, I was pretty much crippled. At that you know, I could spend a week in bed with me back, and at that stage, I learned to lift very carefully. And I still have back problems, but I have a lot less back trouble now at 61 than I did at 18. You, you've got to really be careful, eh, the way you lift and stuff, and the way you move as well. The way you lift, and you know, I still, I still have no trouble going out getting um, a load of honey. Don't care if the box is a chocker, you know, no trouble throwing boxes around. I actually have a lot more trouble with my back working down at ground level. You know, anything like requeening or anything like that, I'm straight down on my knees and just give the old back a rest. It's a good idea. A lot of the younger beekeepers starting out, they kind of like, yeah, they just get knackered, eh, really quickly. I've known a lot of beekeepers give up because their backs have been completely screwed, eh? Big, strong guys and, you know, a friend of mine, you know, he had bees for years, and I went out to help him when he was crippled one day, and watching him try and lift a box of honey, he just had no technique at all. Carried away from his body because he didn't want to get sticky and that sort of thing, and it's like, I can support a full box of honey. Uh, I can carry it around just using one finger from each hand. I mean, I don't normally, but I, whenever I take a young person out, I always show them how to do it because you, you shouldn't be carrying that box. It's just You just rest it on your belt and let your legs do the work. Yeah, it's a good idea. Absolutely. And it's the only industry still that you're allowed to carry 50 kg boxes around, eh? Yeah, it's um, 
Because for years now, all my hives have been on pallets too, which really helps. I mean, you can't shift a, a hive, a pallet by hand. You've got to use a tractor or a, some sort of lift, and that's that's a huge benefit. God, we used to we used to do kiwi fruit, and you'd be shifting, you know, eighty hives sometimes, sometimes one hundred and sixty hives a night, all by hand. Eh, and oh, it was bloody hard work. Do you have like a lifter now on the truck or something? I've got a little forklift I drive around, uh, just tow around on a little trailer. So it's just big enough to lift four hives on the pallet. I mean, do you have a funny beekeeping experience you'd like to share? Oh, funny beekeeping experience. I had a few of those. You want a horrifying one? <laughs> years ago, we, we were the only, uh, for seven years I looked after um, my uncle's hives up on the Coromandel. Because although he's got bees at Rotorua, he's also got hives up on, on the Hurricane Plains and Coromandel. And in those days, we were the only commercial beekeeper on the Coromandel, which might seem amazing now. Probably had about a 1,000 hives up there. There was a hive chocker full of manuka and riddled with foul brood. So had to take it home and burn it, poison it. Probably in, um, in those days, we would have used granular cyanide, the old rabbit of cyanide. Flick a spoonful under, underneath under the floor and um, stick a bit of grass in there, and she was dead as a dodo. And then, so I put it on the truck off down the road and I didn't tie the bloody thing on properly and it fell off all over the road. Foul brood spread everywhere. Fortunately, I saw it go and, you know, we, we I did clean it up very thoroughly. I've had some fun with foul brood and another time, still up on the Hurricane Plains, I had a six-high hive to, to burn and the thing wouldn't light and it wouldn't light, so I'll oh, blow this. I poured a bit of petrol down underneath it and come up with a bit of paper and throw it in and... The whole thing exploded, probably went 15 metres in all directions. <laughs> and the mate said I just disappeared in the explosion, but I was, I was lucky I was standing at the end of the boxes rather than at the side, and it mostly blew out the side, which is the weak side. Yeah, I survived that one, but learned me lesson. Must have been the fumes, eh? Yeah, and all the years I've been beekeeping, you make plenty of mistakes. you just got to learn from them. When the first hive I ever had it, when I was eight, I'll be one of the few people to have burned 100% of their hives because I only had one. They got flipping <laughs> foul brood. So I, I learned early. I've seen an awful lot of foul brood. And I've, you know, I haven't, I've had one in the last five years. You just got to keep continuously looking. Yeah, you do. Every inspection, eh, you've got to be looking for it. Every time I go into a hive, I check for disease. No ifs, no buts. You always look. And I, I don't do a full brood inspection, not, a, not unless a. A yard's got a real history, you know, real problem. I just check one frame and, you know, I don't, well, I do care, but if you miss one cell, you're not, you're not spreading foul brood. It's one of, you know, it's people that take off honey and they just don't even look. That's, they're the ones that spread it. Yeah, yeah. Or they, or they allow the hives to get robbed out too, I guess. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, that's getting, that's not bad beekeeping. That's shocking, terrible beekeeping. Yeah. I've seen plenty of that. I've done a lot of inspecting in my time, you know, as an AP2, but before that we, we you know, didn't used to have things like AP2. You'd just have your local apiary inspector ring you up and ask if you could give them a hand, and you'd just go out and give them a hand. And I've seen hundreds of foul broods, and mostly you can work with education. You can you can teach people. Some people just never seem to learn. I've seen areas where you've, we've been back, we went back, I think it was five years in a row, and in the end there were no highs left, eh? Yeah, we have a lot. We have it. It comes flares up in certain areas in Auckland every so often. You know, we we kind of suspect that there's one particular area we kind of suspect someone's got bees there, but they've been robbing it, getting robbed out or something. I'm I'm pretty keen on this new technology of testing honey. Um, I'll be writing a submission on the new AFB things. You know what they want to do, and I, I think it's a really good idea. But I'd like all honey is now tested for tootin. Or nearly all the honey. I I see no reason why it shouldn't all be tested for AFB. And then when they go out, when you're going out inspecting, you spend probably ninety percent of your time not finding anything because it's not there. You know, you're targeting somebody that's got no foul brood, but you don't know that they've got no foul brood, so you've got to go and have a look. Well, if we had compulsory honey testing, you'd know exactly where to go and exactly who to target. Is that that new method that Mark Goodwin's been talking about? Yeah, yeah, I haven't. I haven't seen all the science on it. I don't know how, you know, obviously it's got to be proven, 
apparently they have been working on it. There's also cost, of course, and it's it sounds like you'll be able to composite samples, though. So if you can composite 10 samples, that'll bring the cost down. And then if they have a sensible system so that if you test 10 samples in a, in a composite and it comes back positive, then you go back through the other samples, find out who's guilty and charge them for the cost of the retest. About time some of these people with foul brood paid the cost. You know, I've been paying my levies for years without complaint, but the people that look out for foul brood and do their job properly don't do any harm at all, but they still pay just as much as the ones that are absolutely bloody hopeless and have foul brood for year after year after year. And I've seen people like that too, just people that never learn. You can teach them all you like, but it's just wasting your time. Well, not quite wasting your time. A lot of it is just not not just not looking, it's not seeing, it's not wanting to see. They pull out a frame and think, oh, that doesn't look right, and just push it back in again rather than checking it. And do you have a lot of problem with unregistered hives in the Hawke's Bay? No, we mostly just have a problem with just too many bloody hives full stop. <laughs> but it's, it's pretty much the same over the whole of the North Island now, I think. We were probably lucky that we were one of the last places to get clobbered, but it's it's costing probably 30 to 40% of my crop every year now just by overstocking. And with the price of honey coming down and everything getting a bit tighter again, it, losing that 30 or 40% is getting pretty expensive. Oh, absolutely. And do you think that's why the honey levy proposed by Epicultures was rejected by a lot of beekeepers then? I think there's a lot of reasons. A lot of people just don't like the, the setup of APNZ. If it had gone through, any levy money would have been used with a weighted vote. These big corporates, which, let's face it, have done a They've certainly done a lot of harm to small beekeepers like me. They just don't give a damn. I've got one local corporate that's put 120 hives across the fence from my 16 hives. And I know that country will run 16 hives because my family's been there for 60 years. We know it won't run any more than 16 hives. So what do you do? Do you move those hives away? I was sort of partly against the, the levy and partly for it. I'm certainly absolutely for a research levy. I am said that they didn't get money to do research. If it had been a straight research levy, then I would have voted for it. Having said that, we wouldn't have the price of money we've got now if we didn't have a, a marketing levy back in the day. Well, that's it. Yeah, we didn't have the people researching the benefits of it, eh? Like, you know, Peter Molan and people like that. Uh, Peter Molan was doing the work. He did the work without any, initially anyway, without any funding, any interest from beekeeping. It was... The marketing levy was Bill Floyd. Bill Floyd did an amazing job getting that all that information out there. You know, you can you can make a discovery, but people have got to find out about it before you get any results from it. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, part of me doesn't want to fork out for a marketing levy, and part of me says, well, you know, I've seen the results of these marketing levies. I've also seen the results of overstocking too. You know, they're getting really good prices for Monica honey now, but you pay so much to be on a farm, and then... The neighbouring farmer finds out that the neighbour's getting money, so he gets a beekeeper in, and they put three or four times the number of hives that should be there. So you're paying a fortune to be there, getting nothing because there's too many hives and all the honey's been eaten. You were better off before. John, what do you think can be done about overstocking and, and hives? Can, do you think it can be legislated, or what, what can be done? Oh, I've, looked, I've looked at legislation. I, we know what happened in the fishing industry. If you have quotas, then you end up with one or two players ending up with all the quota, and I think that would be a real disaster for beekeeping. If the government wanted to do anything useful, they could stop encouraging new beekeepers. MPI could stop all this rubbish about, hey, we can make another $20 billion out of honey. There's only so many flowers to go around, and the banks could stop lending money to these corporates that are losing money hand over fist. Um, the only thing that's going to solve the problem is some people going bust. Yeah, well, I mean, surely if they've got 120 hives in an area that can sustain 16, they're not going to make much money, are they? Yeah, but they've got them there. They're taking them out to the Manuka. Oh, OK. And you could say, oh, well, they're not there while my clover's in flower. But a good year isn't the two boxes you get at the peak of the season. A good year is made up from the box you get before the peak of the season and the box you get in the autumn after the main peak of the season. Yeah. And those hives are there for over 10 months of the year. 
and it, it just has a really dete- it knocks the highs around so much being starved uh, for 10 months of the year that when they the hives are gone they're only just recovered by the time they come back again you still don't get a honey crop so do you think it's, that's the biggest issue facing hawks bay at the moment absolutely the biggest short term issue the biggest long term issue for beekeeping in new zealand has got to be varroa going to come back and bite us unless we get some I'm still hopeful we're going to get some resistant bees at some stage. It's it's easy enough to breed. Well, sorry, it's not easy to breed resistant bees, but it's perfectly possible to breed resistant bees. They seem to be very difficult to carry that breeding on. You know, you can breed a queen that's 100% resistant, but her daughters will range between 100% and zero, and it's hard to tell what's what. But, you know, new genetic research and, um, you know, gene reading and that sort of thing. It's going to make a real difference. Well, I mean, the thing is, unless you control the drone population in the area, you're not. it's always going to get filtered down, isn't it? Yeah. When I, when I look at back over 60 years of records, I can see a, you know, every year is different, but the 10-year average has just gone up and up and up, and that's from breeding, always breeding from for quietness and production. And I think you would get the same thing otherwise, but... That's the other thing with overstocking and so many new beekeepers. I now have no areas where I can breed my own bees. You know, I mean, I still raise all my own queens. In the past, the drone, you know, I'd probably have 90% of the drone population would be mine. Now, you know, it might be 10 or 20%. You got to wonder what some rubbish some of the people have got. I just see, you know, I hadn't seen chalk brood for years, and now I'm seeing chalk brood, and I'm seeing. Carney Olin's crosses all the time, which are not particularly nicest of bees. And I'm seeing a lot more variation in the hives. You know, I used to go into a yard of, a big yard of 40 bees and expect to get 80 boxes or 79 boxes anyway. And now, you know, it might be 20, 30% of the hives sometimes aren't as good as the rest of them. And you think, why is this? Because of genetics, isn't it? Because they're probably bringing in bees from other, other areas as well, I guess. Yeah. There's no doubt that bees that are, super suitable for one area can be a complete disaster in another. Because you, you were involved in the program about the varroa sensitive bees, weren't you? I, I did test a few, yes, and without any great success. I actually got a few queens from Ray Butler last year, ones that are supposed to be varroa proof. Yeah, I, I saw her uh, speak once. She, she's from Nelson, eh? Yeah, and I've actually helped her out quite a bit with, like I've learned to my AI equipment. I did learn how to do AI, but Oh, I just not dedicated enough to get really good at it, I'm afraid. So I lent her my equipment and she sends me the odd queen and I tested four queens last year and one of them was showing quite good resistance and it was also a very nice hive, so I've actually bred from that quite a bit this year. I got another couple of queens from nice Italian queens from a friend down in Nelson and you know, we swap a few queens around and in the past, when I, when I was with my brother, we had 2,000 hives. You didn't really worry about inbreeding, but I've got a, with only 360 hives now, it pays to bring in the odd new breeder, I think. Yeah, absolutely, because you, you primarily produce comb honey now, is that true? I'm a specialist comb honey producer. You need to produce an awful lot of extracted honey to get your crop of comb honey. What, what method do you use to produce your comb honey? I use my own, I, I've designed years ago, we designed our own special comb honey frames. It's an idea my father had, but we've modified it quite a bit on what he was doing. You've got to have good hives. And that's the other thing. When you have, when there's too many hives around, very hard to fill comb honey. They've got to have a good honey flow, and you've got to fill them early. Bees don't like drawing foundation later in the year. No, you've got to have strong hives, though. You've got to have strong hives. You've got to have good queens. Don't have to be one-year-old queens. I I believe a two-year-old queen, well, I can prove it with my production records, two-year-old queens produce just as much honey on average as one-year-old queens. I've tried things like putting the comb honey on as the third box. You know, we we never used to do that in the old days. We always put it on as the fourth box. So I keep, I run my queens in two boxes with an excluder, then a honey box, and then a comb honey box. And you'd think that putting the comb honey on as a third box would fill it faster. I did a few experiments last year and they actually filled the comb honey faster in the four-story hives than they did in the three-story hives. Wow. If you get a really good honey flow, that works really well, but if it's just a bit of a bitsy flow, sometimes they don't join up and they don't. Well, I mean, as you say, the problems in the Hawks Bay, you're not going to get a good flow like that, are you? No. Nope. And what do you do to control varroa mites, John? I've used 
they roll an eighty stand, alternating them. Last autumn, I was pretty sure the spring before last that bay roll was not working as well as it should do. I had a yard, just mainly in one area. Partway through the summer, I could see the varroa was really building up, so I actually put bay roll back into those hives to see what would happen. And a month later, they were almost dead with varroa. And that, that was the time of year I'd normally start treating in the autumn. So from mid-February, I try and get all my treatments in sometime between mid-February and, the, and very early March. Do you think they're becoming resistant to it then? No, uh, that they, they just wasn't working. I was certain they were resistant, but just to be sure, I actually had some hives at home that I'd brought home from that area that had particularly, that really seemed to be showing up the resistance. So with them at home here, I did a, an alcohol wash to get what the mite numbers were to start with, and then I put some bave roll on. I put a you know the full recommended treatment in, and monitor them about once a week with an alcohol wash. And over the next month, the mite numbers went up considerably to the point where the worst hive was starting to show PMS. And at that stage, I changed those hives over to Apivar to save them. I contacted Bayer. I sent them samples of the strips that I used. I sent them samples of the mites, and they did DNA testing and said that there was no sign of resistance in the mites' DNA, which I believe. You know, I've got no problem with what they're saying, but I believe there's some other genetic, other than what they're used to, something else has changed, and these bees, there's no doubt at all that were, they were dying from varroa. It wasn't reinvasion or anything like that. It was because the strips weren't working. I've treated hives that were sick before with bay roll, and within a, a week you never see a mite. You know, you still got mites hatching out, but they just as soon as they hatch out, they're dead. These ones were just riddled with mites after a month, and that's you know, it cannot be anything else but resistance. Yeah, or maybe it's a faulty batch. Do you think? No, I, I sent them the strips off for testing. And I actually went out and sourced a completely different batch for the test, just in case there were, it was a bad batch. Yeah, oh, it sounds like resistance. I can't see what else it can be but resistance. And I'm, I'm not the only beekeeper that had the same problem. Mm. And it's a real blow because bay roll is one of the best treatments. I do want to try oxalic acid, but I'm I'm still uncertain about its legality. It seems really strange. I actually wrote to MPI and asked them if it was legal. And I was actually worried about the glycerin, not the oxalic, because oxalic is legal. They wrote back to me and said that oxalic acid was illegal and I couldn't use it. So I wrote back to them and also sent a copy to Mark Goodwin of what they sent me and we had some more communications and they eventually wrote back and said, oh, yes, no, maybe it is legal. Maybe we were wrong. But they still didn't tell me whether glycerin is legal or not. There's a lot of people putting a lot of stuff in their hives you know, you're not supposed to do that sort of thing. You're not supposed to just bung any old thing just because you think it might work in there. No. Fine if you're doing some testing, you know, if you want to do some trials, but not if you're producing honey. Well, that's it, because if it shows up in honey, if you export it, you can cause, you know, damage to the, to the whole industry, can't you? You can cause all sorts of problems. I mean, we, we really do need a treatment that we can use partway through the honey season. Not every year you need it, but I'll tell you what, when, if Avivar fails as well as Bayroll, then we're really going to be in it. Yeah, well, we've had a lot of success with oxalic acid using the vaporisation method, so it works really well. Yeah. For us. So. Um, I have done, I did a lot of trials with Ruakura years ago, um, working with Ms. Michelle Taylor, and we tried a lot of thymol products. I was very disappointed with them. You know, they killed a few varroa, but they didn't kill enough. The more I see a varroa, the more I think that one varroa is one too many in a hive. Yeah, absolutely, because they double in numbers, don't they? Every brood cycle, isn't it? Oh, they just yeah, they it's just keep constant, on coming. But yeah, keep coming. It was, it was interesting, as part of the trial, I said to Michelle, you know, the controls in this trial were treated with bay roll, and I said, that's not a control, that's a treatment. So I asked if I could put a few, a few more hives in the trial, and I had some that I just didn't treat at all. It was a good autumn that year. So we got an extra box of honey in February. The ones that have been treated with the bay roll, treated in the spring with the bay roll, did an extra box no trouble in February. And the ones that hadn't been treated in the spring, even though they only had, you know, only had one or two mites in the spring, 
and they they were showing mites on a sugar shake, but there was no sign of PMS or anything like that, and no drop in brood numbers or anything like that. It was all uh, beautiful, healthy looking hives, and they that late box they just didn't do it. And you know, eventually, as time went on, as the trial went on and got into the autumn, they started showing PMS and stuff. But well before they started showing any obvious signs of varroa, they were showing marked drops in production. Yeah, it just weakens them, doesn't it? But scary, to be honest. You yeah, know, it's not. It's not good. Do you think that's the biggest mistake you see new beekeepers making is not getting on top of the varroa mites? I've seen an awful lot of people. A lot of hobbyists lose their hives because of rye. I know a tremendous amount of hobbyists that go, oh, you know, I was a bit busy this month or something, so I couldn't treat them. If you haven't got time to do something when it, at the time it needs doing, then you shouldn't be beekeeping. Yeah, absolutely. Oh, I think the worst thing I hear is that they say, I can't see varroa mites on the comb, so there's no varroa mites. Yeah. And I see that all the time. By the time you see varroa, it's just about too late. <laughs> exactly. I actually had a really good year for Varroa this year. I, when I was getting the last of the strips on, I saw one or two hives with just one or two bees with deformed wings, and I saw one or two mites. But I've hardly seen a Varroa all summer, and it's been really nice. Yeah, that's awesome. I mean, so did you think a good idea is for beginners to, to constantly monitor eh, and to like check, you know, do alcohol washes or sugar shake washes or whatever, to just keep an eye on it, you know? Ah. Uh, I have to admit that except when I'm, you know, if I'm taking part in in a, you know, if I'm doing something with Michelle Taylor or something and she'll give me instructions and I'm quite happy to to do all that sort of monitoring. But for myself, I hardly ever do any monitoring at all. I treat at the right time of the year in the spring and the right time of the year in the autumn. And the only other monitoring I do is every time I split those two brood boxes, I look at the drone brood in between the two boxes and just check that for varroa. And as long as I'm not seeing any varroa on that drone brood, I'm not worrying about it. So I really do very little monitoring. I think most people would be better off doing, if you're going to use conventional treatments, you'd be better off just treating by the calendar. Obviously, you've got to make sure it, it works. Like I had to monitor when it became obvious that bay roll wasn't working as well as it should do. And it's still working in some areas, it's just not working in others. At that stage, you've got to, you've got to keep a close eye on things takes a lot of time doing monitoring and you learn an awful lot from monitoring there's no doubt about that but there's a lot to be said for just saying this is a date to treat you know you put the strips in now you take them out on that date and job's done as you say make sure that you check before and after that it's actually working because a lot of people just assume it's working yeah yeah i got i got a friend who tried using those um cords soaked in food grade mineral oil oh yeah yeah you know, he was telling me, this was a few years ago, and he was telling me that he used them all summer and they were working fantastic. I didn't say, well, I hadn't used anything all summer and I wasn't having any trouble. <laughs> and then, you know, come spring, all his hives are dead, you know. <laughs> um, yeah, but it how was, work. How was he measuring that they were working fantastic? That's the question, isn't it? Yeah, because the hives look good. Oh, okay, yeah, yeah. You know, and like I say, I don't, don't treat all summer and... Don't have any problems. <laughs> Treating by the calendar, you do get caught out every now and again. You get y- you do some bad reinvasion and that sort of thing. But I've probably, I don't know, I'd be guessing I'd lost two dozen hives in the last since I've had varroa. Two varroa, probably a dozen of those was last year with the with the failure. So yeah, of bayroll. Yeah, that's good. It's pretty good because I mean, yeah. you're running a lot of hives, eh? So yeah. I mean, the only time I've treated three times in the season was the first, not the first time we saw Vara, we saw a few, few Vara in the summer, because it was about three years later getting here than most of the North Island. We saw a few Vara in the hives, and then we got into autumn, we saw a few more, and then we thought, oh, what are we going to do? And then we blow it. Don't, we're not going to monitor, we're just going to treat every single hive as if they've got Vara probably saved a few highs by doing that and then the next year all the ferals were dying we had to treat three times that year because the reinvasion was just horrific brings up an interesting subject on varroa actually is is whether varroa has been beneficial to new zealand beekeeping and i'd have to say no i'm pretty sure i could (laughs) 
Sorry, I'd have to say no, really. But what, 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 what makes you say that? As far as honey, produ- as far as honey production goes, I would say it has been very beneficial. Yeah, you know, I've got records going back a long way, and you can see a marked jump in the ten-year average with Varroa. Wow, well, what do you reckon the reason for that is? All the ferals were gone. Oh, I see. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So there's less less competition. Well, nobody knows how many ferals were out there. Some areas there probably weren't many. This one area in, in particular is a massive jump in production, which has kept going for 10 years until the corporates decided to dump their hives in next to me up there in the same area, and it's now gone. It's dropped like a lead balloon, and some of that's the seasons, but a lot of it is overpopulation. But do you think the feral bees will come back? They, they have to, don't they, at some point? I don't think they will. If we start breeding truly resistant bees and everybody takes them on board, then absolutely the ferals will come back. Even if a feral hive or two has some resistance, the vast majority of hives in New Zealand are now, you know, probably 99% of them, are kept in hives. And then the drones from those hives will totally dominate the gene pool. Like some of the other day was going, oh, I saw a, an AMM bee, you know, should we be doing something to preserve it? Well, there's no way that a pure Apis mellifera mellifera has survived the last 20 years. They're just not there. And you see the same thing in England. They go, oh, we found a, a black bee in a church, so they must have survived there for the last 100 years. <laughs> what, are the, what are the hell do they think they mated with? Because yeah, then they all get wiped out. They got wiped out, didn't they, a lot of the black bees from that um, Isle of Wight disease, didn't they? Yeah, from tracheal mite, mm. yeah. I mean, you know, some of them did survive. A lot of new beekeepers get quite nostalgic about the, the black bee. You go to England, there's whole magazines devoted to saving the English black bee and the Irish black bee. Well, I, I went out with a friend who's got um, English black bees, and they were... As every bit as nasty as I remember them being here when I was young, eh? <laughs> they have no redeeming features at all. And I thought, oh, maybe this is English beekeeping. I mean, I, I was, don't get me wrong, I really enjoyed my time with my friend John. He's got wonderful gear and beautiful sights, and just he just needs to work on his bees. And then the next week I went out with a commercial beekeeper who's got buckfast bees that are all bred, all his queens come from Denmark. So he's not doing anything to save... British genetics, and the first day I was pretty blimmin' nervous because I got actually got stung up <laughs> when I was working with these other ones. Left a tiny gap in my veil. You know, normally I don't worry about a bit of a gap. Boy, they found that. <laughs> and working with these buckfasts, after a couple of days, you don't bother doing your hood up, and the, the boss was just ro- doing the bees the whole time without a veil on at all. They were beautiful bees. Oh, that's awesome. And very productive too. Because we have a lot of people coming over from England and visiting us, and they're surprised that we can stand near the hives without without gear on, you know? Because their bees are just vicious. A lot of it's genetic, and some of it's environmental. When I ran hives for my uncle up on the Coromandel, I maintain any beehive is twice as nasty on the Coromandel as it would be in Hawke's Bay. Take the same hive from Hawke's Bay to Canterbury, and it'll be quieter again than it is here. Was it because it must be the weather, do you think? I'm sure it's the weather. Yeah. Well, they'd get more rain in the Coromandel, wouldn't they? It's. I think it's probably the humidity. Believe me, they they taught me some lessons on how to avoid being stung up there, and it took me a long time to get used to like wearing shorts under my overalls and not wearing elastics on my gloves and that sort of thing. Now, you know, my highs down home, I, when I'm working commercially, I wear veils, gloves, everything. I don't muck. You know, I'm not there to muck around. Yeah. If I'm just doing a bit of rec cell raising or, you know, when I have a hobbyist day here and showing people around my hives at home, I never wear a veil. I certainly never consider breeding from a hive that you couldn't work with just a smoker. Yeah, good idea. Yeah, I mean, that, surely that can't be fun working those bees, eh, if you're a hobbyist in England. No, and it's not fun for your neighbours. It's not fun for anybody. No, no, exactly. They're not the the brilliant disease-resistant bee that people make them out to be. You know, when we first got chalk brood in New Zealand, anything with any AMM in it just got chalk brood like you wouldn't believe. The Italians are far healthier. A lot of the Italians did have a reputation for being overbreeders and just, you know, eating all their winter stores and that sort of thing. The bee we have in New Zealand, or the bee I have, is bred for my conditions, and it's it's got AMM in it. 
It's got, you know, it's predominantly Italian, but it's got Caucasian in it. It's got Carniolan. You know, all those bees were already in New Zealand years ago. The best features were selected and continuously bred for. And I, I normally shut my hives down in two stories with six heavy frames of honey. And I do that in April. And I don't go near them till I never start before the 15th of August in the spring. And most of them will still have three frames of honey on, you know, three and a half, four months later. Yeah, that's good. I mean, they probably get some good, they still get some good days, would they, in winter, do you think, down there? Generally speaking, you get nothing. I mean, around home here, um, or before it got totally overstocked, you could, you often got a box of honey out of the gums in the winter. But most of my sites, they get very little. They they get some nice days for flying. It's really important to get a cleansing flight in. I used to see that when I had bees on the Coromandel and the Hurricane Plains. The Coromandel, there was always a bit of something flowering. They would keep going all winter. Whereas on the Hurricane Plains, a bit of a cold, damp hole in winter. And the hives would always come through stronger on the Hurricane Plains than they would on the Coromandel. Because they're not losing their bees going off and doing things. Our, Our bees are designed to have a winter. And they're designed to have a break. Yeah, well, that's it. I mean, they're, they're from England, aren't they, originally? Or from, not England, Europe. Europe. Probably the original bees came from Africa. Yeah. As did we, John. It's a different sort of a story, but, yeah. But our bees have definitely adjusted to a, a winter. You know, I've got friends in Canada I've stayed with, and he was importing some queens from Hawaii. And I was saying, what the hell do you think you're doing? I, I maintain, if you've got a problem with a disease, like, say, chalk brood, then you get queens from someone where the weather is just the worst for chalk brood. If you're having trouble with wasps, get get some breeders from someone that is in an area where there's thousands of wasps. Yeah, Nelson. You know, if you're having trouble with bees not wintering in the cold, get someone from a breeder from someone who's twice as cold as you are. Not not from up northland. <laughs> We've had some beautiful queens from up northland years ago, and they were they were just gorgeous, yellow and quiet, and the wasps killed every single one, eh? Yeah, yeah, that went, went like tough every enough. every single one. Yeah, do, do you have a lot of wasps down that your way then? Have a lot of wasps, and some areas always have bad wasps. A lot of areas occasionally get bad wasps. Vespex is the best thing since sliced bread. It's just just amazing. I I don't... Don't follow the instructions too much about pre-feeding or anything like that. When you're just putting out a few baits just around your hives, it's cheaper just to put them out. If you think you're going to have a problem, you put the baits out. If you find a problem, you just put the baits out. If they don't take the baits this time because they're not feeding on it, put them out next time. Boy, it makes a difference. I think last year was the first year I never lost a single hive to a wasp nest last year, last winter. Oh, that's awesome. I don't normally lose too many. Wouldn't be very often I don't lose any. I do use hot entrance blockers and stuff, but and I do spend a lot of time tracking wasps, but I've got one site where I regularly get between 20 and 30 nests a year within 200 metres of the hives. It's an awful lot easier to put some Vespex out. Oh, especially in thick bush. It's almost impossible to find them sometimes, eh? Yeah, and I don't like wasp things. I really don't, and they like stinging you, so... They enjoy it. can do it multiple times, too. They do. Mm. When there's 30 nests, the chances of missing one or two are pretty high. You know, the damage is not going to be as bad. If you miss one or two, it's not as bad as having 30 there. They're still going to do some damage. And it's not just stealing the honey. It's the bees, I'm sure they get aged by being hassled all the time. Well, yeah. Yeah, absolutely. They just don't live through the winter. They die of, you know, stress or whatever. Well, yeah, exactly. Because they're constantly fighting. So what's your plans for next season then? Sort of more of the same or? Yeah, I've, I've, I've got one or two sites I think I'm going to have to give up on. Too much tooting in the honey. That site with 120 hives next door, I'm going to talk to the farmer. I don't want to give up. You know, my grandfather had bees on his grandfather's farm. I don't want to just say, no, I can't keep bees here anymore, but um, might get him to try and chat to his neighbours and see if we can tell him to piss off, you know. Well, he might have more of a more of a you know more of an opportunity because he probably knows him better and stuff. Yeah, it's a real shame that this sort of what's going on, eh? Because it's just my you can't you can't easily see my bees from the road, so I gave them the benefit of the doubt and thought maybe they don't know they're there. 
So when I saw them there one day, I stopped in and had a chat and said, look, you know, I've had bees there for 60 years. They're just over there. See, you can see them if you look. Yeah. And uh, I thought, yeah, this will, I'll be right, but no. Did, did they say, what do they say? Were they very receptive to it or not really? Oh, it was, it was just, just the workers so that, you know, you can't really rant at them. They're not the ones that making the orders. You know, that, that's bad enough. But the other thing is just about every site I've got, even when it's not, you know, Monica production, Somebody has stuck, has stuck a, a site between them. In the long run, that's probably just as damaging because, you know, this yard with 120 hives, I'm probably going to have to shift it. But the, the ones with, a, you know, 20 hives or 24 hives dumped between these sites that I run 16 hives in, you know, that's still costing me 20, 30, 40% of my crop. It means I can't do comb honey on them anymore because they're just not producing enough honey. and Not enough nectar. And there's, there's no, you can't just move, you know, it used to be if, you wanted a new site, you just went and found somewhere where there's no bees and moved. Well, there's, there is nowhere with no bees anymore. No. It's a situation that's happening all over, eh? It's just, is it only because yeah. the manuka, do you think, is driving it there? Um, well, in a lot of these sites, there's no manuka at all. So, you know, some of it's manuka and some of it's just, just more beekeepers. I mean, I used to know every commercial beekeeper in Hawke's Bay and you could count them on two hands. And now I wouldn't know quarter of them every day that somebody wants to get into beekeeping i think if one or two of them go bankrupt it's gonna gonna sort it out a little bit why people think that you can run you know if you went to a farmer and said you know you've got a thousand cattle i can run ten thousand cattle on your farm he'd just laugh at you <laughs> beekeepers go along to farmers and say i can run 10 times the number of hives in this area and they think oh yeah that's good and it's, it's not. Primary good from bees in New Zealand is clover pollination. And that's something we forget. And it's still, clover pollination is still worth more than all the honey, all the kiwi fruit, all the apples, everything else. The pollination of clover is still worth more than all of that put together. And it's being threatened. If we end up with nothing but people flying highs into the Manuka every year and all the established beekeepers gone, there's going to be no clover pollination. You're already seeing this with Convita. They've decided they can't make any money out of clover, so in Hawke's Bay anyway, they're just leaving like one one hive behind and everything else is being moved out for the summer into the Manuka. What's that going to do for the pastors in New Zealand? Not a lot of good. Yeah, it's, it's, it's a, you know, I can't see any way around it, eh? I mean, it's just crazy. No, I, I cannot see any way around it, and it's the, it's by far the biggest stressor for me. That's why my brother retired. He just, just had enough of the hassles. You just look at it and think, is it even worth trying, eh? Every day that I go out, I see a new site. I, you know, and it's not just me. I see, you know, I've got lots of beekeeping friends and I see a, a site dumped right on top of theirs. And I've got a friend I know, he's struggling. He's a good beekeeper. He wants his son to join his business. Well, what's the point of that if, you're not making any money. Well, that's it. There's only a limited amount of nectar out there, eh? Yeah, there's only so many flowers. Exactly. I, I think I worked out that this guy was dumping something like 10 million extra bees on top of me. When you work it out like that, it starts getting a bit scary, eh? Oh, absolutely. But I mean, surely next year he'll, he'll, they'll, all, they'll all fail and he'll have to move them somewhere else, won't he? Hopefully. Oh, he doesn't always leave them there. He's got tens of thousands of hives and they just he splits them up and... Most of his sites, his wintering sites, have got about 30 hives in, which is still two or three times what the area needs. Yeah. And they yeah. just dump between everybody else's sites. So, like I say, is it worse to have 120 hives in one spot or 30 hives everywhere? It's been going on. The first overstocking came with kiwi fruit. Everybody started getting into kiwi fruit pollination and they just dumped on top of everyone there. Yards used to be two miles apart, and there was a reason for that. You know, in the old days, you had to be a really good beekeeper to survive. When I was young, we never used to make boxes. It was always cheaper to buy out somebody that had gone broke. Always. <laughs> that, that's how Arataki got as big as it got, by buying out people that just couldn't make it. They didn't go, they didn't go looking for people to buy out. They'd, you know, they'd be... People were always offering them hives, and people would start up, and they'd they'd run for a year or two, and then they'd get fell brood, and then you know, 
or they find that it was an awful lot of hard work for not much money, and next thing you know, they'd be trying to sell them, and they couldn't sell them to anybody, and in the end they'd come and see Dad or Granddad, and they'd buy them. And Yeah. Yeah. I don't know. We need, we need to get, think about it as an industry aid eh, and what, what we can do about it. There has to be some kind of law or some kind of licensing situation. I don't know. It's, but as you say, with the yeah, fishing aid. How, eh, how are you going to do it so that... It's um, fair, aid. Eh? That's got to be fair for everyone. One person doesn't end up with all the, all the power. It's, mm. it's like Manuka sites. You know, I lost some very good Manuka sites because I was outbid. When you know what an area will produce and how many hives you can run in an area... Um, there's no point in offering to pay three or four times what it's worth to be there. You know, you know that the person moving in there isn't going to produce the honey they think they're going to produce, but you can't meet what they're offering. I was, I was heard of a case today where somebody was paying seventy-five thousand dollars a year to be on a farm. They had a five-year contract, and apparently they they never made a cent out of it. <laughs> How can they afford to do it that? Gives, it gives all the neighbouring farmers, oh, this is worth $75,000. It's yeah. not somebody stupid enough to pay $75,000. There's no way you can make any money out of doing it. But they won't be in business for long if they're making that kind of loss, will they? I know who it is, but I'm not going to comment on it. But I no. did hear they made a fairly substantial loss this year. Oh, man, I hate to think what people have lost this year in Hawke's Bay because the, the Manuka crop in Hawke's Bay is pretty much zero this year mainly because of the, um, it just rained every day up in the hills. You know, you hear people talking about expenses of up to $800 per hive per year. You know, when you've got 20,000 hives and you're spending $800 a hive, you ain't going to be in business very long. No. Yeah, I think they're all thinking this Manuka's like the dream thing and it's going to make even millionaires, eh? But it's not like that, is it? Nope. Actually... You've got to wonder, we've had a couple of fairly poor years for Manuka production and yet there still seems to be a lot of stocks and not that much demand. I don't know if the bubble's burst, but I think it might be deflating a little bit. Yeah, I think so. Interesting thing this year is actually I did end up with a few boxes of Manuka from a Manuka plantation and that was really annoying because it got tested by yeah, on MPI standards. Uh, I rated it by eye at about 70% Manuka, so not pure, but, you know, not bad. Rates as non-Manuka. Passes on the genetics and that sort of thing, but it's got not enough of one and too much of something else. Oh, okay. So it's not even rated as, as multi-Manuka, but, you know, you can go on the internet and get a formula of how much clover to mix with it, which will make it into multi-Manuka. <laughs> and that is just stupid to have honey that's, Obviously, got a good percentage of manuka, but you cannot call, even call it multifloral manuka. But if you mix enough clover with it, it magically becomes multifloral manuka. They need to get their science in order. I mean, the beekeepers brought it on themselves by fighting over over what was and wasn't manuka, and you know nobody would agree on the standard. And then people were adulterating honey wholesale. Oh yeah, and. I largely hold MPI responsible for that. I mean, people are responsible for their own actions, but every bit of honey we take off for years is you've got to fill in the harvest declaration and everything else. They know what people are producing. They know what people sold. And when somebody buys 50 tonne of honeydew and 50 tonne of manuka and then sells 100 tonne of manuka, you'd think they could track that. (laughs) No, if if you forget to... Put a dot on an eye or something. They come. The auditors come down on you like a ton of bricks. But you, you adulterate fifty tons of honey with something else, and oh no, we we got no jurisdiction there. We don't know what's happening there. Well, it's interesting. There's there's a case coming up in Auckland, isn't there, with that company? We're adding MGO yeah. to honey as well. So that's going to be interesting to see what happens about that. Oh, do you remember them people advertising Monica Booster and that sort of thing? That's all the same sort of thing. Oh, okay. And they're certainly not the only one. You know, we were seeing plus 40 manukas and that sort of thing for sale. It doesn't, well, I've never seen anything occurring, anything like that level naturally. There's an awful lot of cowboys out there. Yeah, do do you think that the new standard will stop a bit of that, or what do you think? I think it would have if it had been set up properly. One of the troubles with the standard is it's actually got a fair bit of wiggle room. I saw some honey last year that was rated as pure manuka that was nowhere near nowhere near as good as the stuff that got failed the other day it just depends what's in it 
And the trouble with a standard that's as loose as that is that unscrupulous packers are going to look at the standard and go, right, well, I can, I've got 50 tonne of manuka, well, I can, I can add two tonne of clover and I can add three tonne of this and a bit of something else and it'll still just squeak in the standard, you know. They're actually encouraging people to, to adulterate their honey and it makes it very hard for the honest ones. Yeah, it's, it's true. Karnika and Manika have always been sold as the same honey. They taste the same. They look the same. You can't tell the difference just looking at the honey. And as far as eating it goes, they taste the same. So what the hell I'd like to see a, a UMS standard and the rest of the table Manika and Karnika is the same bloody thing and always has been. Cool, man. Well, thanks for, thanks for talking to us tonight. Yeah, no worries. It's got dark while we've been talking. I know. <laughs> I'll go, go and get a cup of coffee now. Yeah, thanks, John. Right on. See ya. Wow. That was good, eh? I mean, that, a lot of it, useful information there for New Zealand beekeepers. Fantastic. Absolutely. And a good, some good information about varroa resistance. Yeah, especially with bay roll, eh? That, that's a, um, a continuing story because some people swear by it, but um, obviously it's not working for some areas of the Hawke's Bay, is it? Well, it seems to be that a lot of the forums are saying that that is just not working, even um, Appistan. So you know, it's it's uh, it is a trial, but it's really great to see that he's involved with doing some help and understanding what's going on, eh? Absolutely, it's great to hear he's rescuing Tui's as well, eh? Yes, I mean our Tui's are very important to us. From your perspective, Gary, what are your takeaways? Well, my key takeaways. Uh, one, there's only so many flowers to go around. Two, the biggest long-term problem in New Zealand is varroa mites. Three, bees are affected by varroa mites before you see any sign of PMS. And four, if you don't have time to help your bees at the time they need it, you shouldn't be keeping bees. What do you think of those takeaways? I agree. I think that people, when they take up the beekeeping, they need to understand, they need to learn and learn what they need to do and take the time to do it and be prepared. Absolutely. Do you love what we do? Did you find something useful for your beekeeping in our last show? Or are you subscribing to our free newsletter or do you want to help us produce more content in addition to being a supporter it also gives you some extra things like exclusive secret rss feed that provides you with early access to shows you get the shows a week before the general release date awesome and also exclusive supporter behind the scenes videos via the Patreon application. And we also thank you personally on our podcast. So the other thing, the final thing that you get by becoming a supporter, you will get a warm heart. You'll sleep better at night knowing you are helping the beekeeping community and helping Gary and Margaret produce more shows videos and blog posts for the beekeeping community. So Gary. So why not join us today at kiwi.bz slash banana. Yes, and the show notes for this podcast are kiwi.bz slash berry. Awesome guys. And you know, thank you so much to all our patrons and our supporters. You are awesome and you help us make this happen. We want everyone to become a patron, eh? Yes, that'd be awesome. That'd be just fantastic because, honestly, with all your help, we've been able to keep this thing going and the buzz buzzing. That's right, and I checked a lot of tickets today and we did not win a game. Uh, <laughs> even if we did, guys, we wouldn't abandon you. We wouldn't. That's our promise. Okay, well, that was a good one, wasn't it? It was. We, we must do some more interviews, eh, coming up. I've got some people keen to come on. Yeah, it was very good to talk to, John. Just trying to find the time to fit everything in. Didn't you get that, Gary? Very good to talk to John. It was very good to talk to John. I'm sure John has never heard that before. I'm sure he hasn't. But, um, yeah, we 
that they get something sorted in the Hawke's Bay and get that clover up and running. And maybe this time of the year as it starts to cool, they might get something coming up because it's still warm. But I don't know. Watch the space, eh? And I think this overstocking issue in New Zealand is just getting worse and worse, isn't it? I think eventually that will even itself out. I really do. Because there's a few tryhards in the industry that uh, won't make it, Gary. Well, as John says, it's going to take a few people to go bankrupt, isn't it? Which is sad for the families. Until next time, we'll see you later. See you guys. Have a good one. See ya. (laughs) You have to do that. You have to do it. Come on, let's go and have a cuppa. Cup of tea, eh, Snow?